Uh, my name is Thomas Cullen. I'm an assistant professor of paleobiology at Auburn University. And what I do is I study ancient ecosystems and the animals that lived in them. So dinosaurs today are most closely related to birds and to crocodilians. And birds, of course, have no teeth, so they're not necessarily the best model to answer the question of whether the, their ancestors had lips or not. But crocodilians are the sort of next closest living thing to them, and they don't have lips. And so that was one of the main reasons why um, dinosaurs like T-Rex were often portrayed in the media without having any lips at all. An animal that's consistently exposed to air will thin and break down and crack more easily than an animal that is kept in a moist environment, like in the mouth and sort of surrounded and enclosed. And so we sought to look at this specific uh, feature of, of teeth and, and tooth wear in dinosaurs and see if it's more similar to something like a crocodile today, where we know that their teeth sort of wear down more on the outside, the side that faces outside of the mouth than they do on the side that faces the inside of the mouth. And that's because on the outside of the mouth, those teeth are exposed to the air a lot. It's it's sort of mitigated a little bit in crocodilians because they actually do spend a lot of time actually in the water, but they spend enough time with their teeth exposed to air that it, it causes the outside of the enamel to get a lot thinner than the inside where they're still being kept moist by their breath. In animals that have lips, usually you see a sort of even wear um, of that sort on the inside and outside surfaces of the tooth. And um, we wanted to see if dinosaurs were the same as crocodilians in this respect or the same as animals with lips. And in fact, they're more similar to animals with, with lips. Their enamel thickness is the same on the outer surface and on the surface that faces the inside of the mouth. We looked at the idea that's been also brought up in the literature a few times that maybe some dinosaurs like T-Rex simply have teeth that were too large to fit in their mouth without being, uh, or, or could po couldn't possibly be covered with lips because they're too big. And we looked at the size of the teeth relative to the size of the skull in a number of different dinosaurs and compared those to a number of different groups of animals today, like lizards, and found that there are a number of different living species of lizards, for example, today that actually have teeth that are proportionally larger, again, to the size of their own skulls than any dinosaur's teeth, including T-Rex. And so that was another line of evidence saying it's at least conceivably possible that they had lips. And then we have two um, more qualitative pieces of evidence from the anatomy of the, the, the bones of the dinosaurs themselves. The first is um, the series of pits along the upper jaw bones that in living animals uh, are often associated with the presence of lips because they are the areas that would have housed um, blood vessels and nerves and other structures in the soft tissues to supply those tissues around the mouth. Um, and in crocodilians, you have a sort of different anatomy that's much more distributed and related to some of the adaptations they have for sensing vibration in the water and distinct from animals that have um, really defined lips. Fieldwork is probably my favorite part of my job, so I'm, I always try to be out there whenever I can. My primary research is not really in these sort of questions of, of soft tissue anatomy. Uh, this has sort of a, been a fun project that was going for a long time, but my main research actually is in looking at entire sort of communities and ecosystems in the fossil record, particularly at the time of dinosaurs, and trying to pull together all the different groups of animals that are living there, looking at the geochemistry in their bones and their teeth to figure out um, where they're moving around, what they were eating, things like that. And to, in order to collect the data for that, it requires a lot of field work. And, and so historically, my main field areas have been in um, southern Alberta and Montana in the Badlands there. And I've also done field work in a number of other places, including we have sort of active field collaborations going right now in northern British Columbia, up in the mountains, as well as um, with other colleagues down in Utah. Um, I've done some field work in Argentina uh, and in the Arctic, and we did very briefly down in the Antarctic. So I've, I've had a chance to travel a lot for my uh, for my research, and it's, like I said, it's my favorite part of the job. The field work itself, in terms of digging things up, Jurassic Park, unfortunately, made it look a lot easier. I kind of wish it was like that, where they're sitting over this nice, beautifully exposed skeleton with little toothbrushes and stuff, and it's there's no hard work at all. They're just kind of sitting there finding the bones so nicely. I really wish it worked that way, but normally what happens is you very rarely find skeletons that are that nice. Uh, and when you do, um, it's usually much more effort to actually expose them at the surface and, and it's not quite as nice. Things are often cracked and broken. And you would also never in the field with, so I guess maybe some very rare exceptions, you would never really expose the whole skeleton like that. You would try to just show the edges of the bone and keep things covered so you can plaster the whole thing up, bring it back to the lab and then have technicians in the lab slowly actually expose the bones like they are on the surface in Jurassic Park because 
leaving them out exposed to the elements like that for potentially weeks at a time is going to just damage them.